Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. Come in, have a seat. My name's Dave. If I haven't met you, I'll be leading you in worship this morning. Uh, it's a good thing when we start worship to hear from God's word. So I'm going to read you from Psalm 103, just the first bit. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Let's stand and sing praise to our God. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him, live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open eyes. His one and only Son to save. For God so loved the world that He gave us. His one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in Him will live forever. The power of hell forever defeated. Now it is well. I'm walking in freedom. God so loved, God so loved the world. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Now we're going to sing another song, which is a new one we learnt last week. But before we do that, I just want to read a bit more of Psalm 103 uh, from verse 6. It says, The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Let's keep singing. Mm -hmm. 
This is a new one we did last week, so just pick it up as you get it. What kind of father would run, run, run to me? Thank you, God, that you um, are a Father who loves us, who shows grace to us, who uh, doesn't judge us by what we've done when we submit to Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you'll help us to have open minds and hearts to your word today. Help us to be thankful and full of joy for what you've done for us and help us to um, be willing to serve you and to receive your word today. Amen. Thank you, Dave. Please take a seat. It's wonderful to be here at church this morning uh, where we open God's Word, where we sing praises to Him, where we get excited about Jesus. And, and today we're going to hear more about Jesus from the Bible. We're looking at J the book of John, and as you can see on the screen in our series called The Passion, and we're at the moment, we're looking through Jesus' prayer 
in John 17. And it's a really, really interesting prayer. It's like the longest prayer that Jesus prayed, which is recorded for us. And it's really fantastic. And today we're going to look at the second part of that. And we'll see where Jesus prays for his uh, disciples. Uh, We're going to have the Bible reading now. But how about I pray again before we hear God's word. Father God, we just want to thank you so much uh, for who you are. Uh, We thank you so much that we could come here and worship you and sing praises to you and honour your son, Jesus. And now we get to actually hear what Jesus prayed, which is recorded for us in John's Gospel. Lord, please open our hearts to your wonderful words that we may take them in, consume them like we've had at breakfast, consume them. And also put them into action in our lives. And we just want to thank you so much in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Hello, everybody. My name is Ruben, as you probably already know. And I will be doing the Bible reading today. This Bible reading is from John chapter 17, verses 6 to 18. I'll let you find that. I have revealed to you, to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has to come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and your world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth of your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. There's one more verse. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Thank you, Reuben. Uh, Friends, it's now time for our children to go out to their programs. And uh, if you are from 18 months to five years of age, you're in the group called Explorers. Uh, So could you go out there and meet your leaders? And if you're in kindergarten to year six, you're in the group called Jungle. So could go there and meet your leaders. Now, for those that are in high school in the building, uh, I believe there's some things uh, that we can get for you. So I'll let um, hand that one actually over to Adam to go get those things for you and he will deliver them personally to your seat. Uh, So if you're still here, have a talk to the person next to you before we have our next song. Thank you. 
Okay, I encourage you to continue those conversations later. When you're ready, please stand and join us in singing King of Kings.
It's great, isn't it, to sing praises to God, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Our prayer time this morning, I'm going to centre around some passages from Revelation and then towards the end of the, our prayers around some of the Psalms. We began with some Psalms that Dave read to us, which was fabulous. So let's come before God and give honour and glory to him. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. We praise you, Lord God Almighty, Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. You alone, Lord Jesus Christ, are worthy because you were slain and with your blood you purchased us for our Father. We praise you, Jesus, for your blood and it has purchased those from every tribe, from every language, from every people and from every nation. Lord God, we pray for those around us here, for those of us that have come to church this morning, for those of us that may be watching online. And Lord God, we pray not only for ourselves, but Lord, for all the people in this district, that they may come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, you've made us to be a kingdom and priests and to rule on earth, and we praise you. To you, Father, who sits on the throne, and to you, Jesus, the Lamb who was slain, be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. Last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, the commencement of the season of Lent, leading up to Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. I'm going to read the prayer for Ash Wednesday and for the season of Lent. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made and you forgive the sins of all who truly repent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, rightly lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may obtain from you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I continue in prayer based on uh, Psalm 145. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name. I will meditate on your wonderful works. I'll proclaim your great deeds. You, Lord God, are gracious. You are compassionate. You are slow to anger and rich in love. You uphold all those who fall. You lift up all those who are bowed down. You are near to all who call on you. You watch over all who love you. I will speak your praises, O Lord. Let every creature praise your holy name. Father God, we thank you for all that you have provided for us. Lord, we so frequently take you for granted. We pray for those around us who live and work and go to school. So many who do not yet know you. So many who choose to ignore you and go their own way. O Lord, have mercy on them. Lord, we pray that you will grow your church. We pray that you'll stir us up to trust in you for each part of our lives. Lord, that we will trust you for today and tomorrow and forever. O Lord, stir us up to pray for those in this district who do not yet know you. Lord, stir us up to pray for Mark and for Adam and their families and for Christine and Bonnie Ann. Lord, we pray your blessing upon our playtime that meets on Thursdays at the Lara Community Centre. Stir us up to pray for those children and their parents. Lord, we pray for our youth gatherings during the week and we pray for their parents as well. Father God, we bring before you one another's needs. Lord, help us to pray and to be a blessing to others around us. Stir us up to pray for those that you've already sent to other places, other countries. For our link missionaries, Ryan and Leanne Verghese, Lynn Verghese, we pray, Lord, that you would bless them as they serve the people of the Seychelles. Father, thank you for the amazing safety and comfort that we enjoy here in Australia. We pray for those in Gaza. We pray for those in Ukraine. 
We pray for those in other countries where there is warfare, floods, famine and drought. Lord, comfort and sustain those in these hostile circumstances. Bring peace, Lord God, in these places. And bring peace in families where there is domestic violence, in our local area and throughout the world. Lord God, we pray that people will turn to you. O oh Lord, thank you for the Apostle John and his recording of Jesus' prayers for himself in his gospel. Lord, we thank you for his prayers for himself, for his disciples and for all believers. Lord God, we pray that you'll draw our hearts and minds today to your holy word as we listen to Jesus' prayers. Anoint Adam with your Holy Spirit as he opens your word to us. And bless us, Lord, by your spirit that we may do what you call us to do. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Alan, for praying, and good morning, everyone. If we haven't met before, my name is Adam. I'm one of your pastors here at Life Anglican Church, Marsden Park. And I have a odd question for you, but I promise I'm going somewhere with this. Are narwhals real? I have a good friend. Uh, we used to go to church together at a previous church. She's a vet. She's highly educated. She's very intelligent. But she doesn't think narwhals are real or at least she didn't think they were real. But if you think about her reasoning, it makes sense. She's never seen one with her own eyes. She's ne you know, never studied them properly. And her sister, who is constantly trying to trick her, tell her fibs, play pranks on her and all this sort of thing, her sister is the only one in her life saying, no, sis, I promise you, narwhals are real. So of course my friend didn't think they were real. Her source of information was not that very legitimate. It's not that very good. I mean, it wasn't really until I said to her, you know, actually, they are real, that she started to consider the truth, that maybe narwhals are real. But that's kind of what we're getting at here. Truth. What is the truth and how do we know it? Because we can decide that narwhals don't exist. But that doesn't change the fact that they do. That doesn't change the fact that there is truth. And of course, the most fundamental truth in the world isn't that narwhals are real. The most fundamental truth is that Jesus is real, that Jesus is God. So how do we know that? How do we know that Jesus is God? Well, because of the apostles. Jesus' closest disciples, those who were with him since the beginning of his ministry. On their testimony, the apostles witness to the risen Lord Jesus, do we place our faith? But did the apostles get anything wrong? Or even worse, have the apostles made it up? Have they made up this story about a risen Lord Jesus to trick all of us? Thankfully, in John chapter 17, Jesus prays for his apostles, his closest followers, his disciples. And through this prayer, we can see how rock solid the apostles' testimony to Jesus is, how legitimate it is. Because Jesus' prayer for his apostles gives the apostles authenticity. But we also see how beautiful this prayer is. It's full of Jesus' love for his friends, the disciples. It's full of his care and concern for them, his desire to love them. His heart is on full display. And so let's see how Jesus prays for his disciples, the 11 who were with him the night before he dies. Let's see Jesus pray for his apostles specifically, starting at verse 6. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now, if you were here last week, you would have seen how Jesus began this prayer. In the first few verses, Jesus was praying about his great care and concern for his Father's glory, for God's glory, and how he has also been glorified. 
Here we get a sense of how Jesus has glorified the Father. But there's more to come. Jesus has revealed the Father to those who he has been given out of the world. Now, there's a lot going on here. There's a lot to unpack, but we're just going to touch on a few things briefly. First, the idea of revealing. Throughout John's Gospel, Jesus has made the claim that if you are looking at him, you are looking at God. That's a pretty big claim. But let's have a look at John chapter 14, verse 9, as an example, where Jesus says to his apostle Philip, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And earlier on as well, in John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus says, very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the, son, uh, whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Only as the Gospel makes clear as we read the whole thing, many, in fact most people, reject Jesus' claims to be God. They reject his claims that he is revealing God. But the apostles didn't. They believed. Only because God opened their eyes to see the truth. God helped them to see. God gave them to Jesus out of the world. The world, not meaning the planet that we're on, but humanity. Specifically, humanity in hostile, open rebellion towards God. There's a tip for you. Whenever you're reading John's Gospel and you come across the phrase, the world, more often than not, it is referring to humanity in hostile, open rebellion towards God. But this is the very world that, as we sang about earlier, God so loved that he sent his one and only son. But here in verse 6 of our passage, Jesus is praising the Father because of the apostles. They have obeyed the Father's word. How? By believing in Jesus' claims. Jesus' claims about who he is. Jesus, the word of God made flesh. Verse 8. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. Now, admittedly, throughout the whole gospel, the apostles' belief in Jesus can look shaky, can look a little bit iffy. They misunderstand things all of the time. They get stuff wrong. And mere hours after Jesus finishes this prayer in John chapter 17, all of them are going to abandon Jesus. All of them will abandon him as he is put on trial and executed on a cross. But, and spoiler alert for the end of the gospel, by the end of it, they all come back. And Jesus welcomes them back. Jesus lovingly welcomes them back. They meet with, eat with, and even touch the physically, bodily, risen Lord Jesus, risen from the dead. They touch him. They see Jesus truly alive. But even though throughout the gospel their understanding is shaky at times, that doesn't stop them from believing that Jesus was sent by the Father, sent to complete the Father's plan. The apostles know who Jesus is. And because they know who Jesus is, they know who the Father is, because Jesus has revealed the Father to them. But let's pause for a moment and think about who the apostles are specifically. This is important because people today also claim to be apostles. The the apostles that Jesus is talking about, that he's praying for, are specific men that he has handpicked to be his key witnesses in the world, to be people who learn from him directly, to see his miracles firsthand, to see his works firsthand. They are those people. Jesus sent them into the world specifically, and he is not going to choose any more apostles today. And we'll see why later in his prayer. We'll see why later. But the point is, what I'm really getting at here is that these men know who Jesus is. Jesus has revealed the Father to them. He's revealed himself to them as well. Their testimony then about Jesus is reliable. 
you can trust it. Jesus has truly revealed the Father to them. And so out of deep love for them as well, Jesus prays specifically for them. Verse 9, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. Now, let's not get too hung up on Jesus not praying for the world as if he doesn't care about the world. Nothing could be further from the truth. We will see why later. The real focus on this part, the middle part of Jesus' prayer in John 17, is the apostles, because they are his key witnesses. You see, Jesus knows exactly what kind of world he is sending them into. He knows he's sending them into a hostile world because the world has been nothing but hostile to Jesus. Jesus knows it will reject his apostles because the world rejected him. So by praying for them, Jesus is giving them the best possible care and love, the highest form of care and love that he can at that time, the best possible chance of success, actually a guarantee of success in the mission that he is sending them on, sending them into the world. But why does it matter? Why does it matter to us today that Jesus has prayed for his apostles? Why should we worry about that? Well, because Jesus' prayer adds tremendous authenticity to the apostles' message. It makes it true. You see, Jesus has prayed that he has revealed the Father to them. And this tells us that the apostles know God. They have not gotten the information wrong. They've gotten it from Jesus himself. They know what they're talking about. This is really important for us. Why? Because of the New Testament. Think about what the New Testament is. It is written almost entirely by the apostles or by people in close association with the apostles. I mean, Matthew, an apostle. Mark traveled with Peter, an apostle. Luke interviewed apostles. John, the apostle who wrote the gospel we just heard from before. Paul, who wrote most of those letters in the New Testament. An apostle, admittedly an apostle after Jesus chose him after going into heaven. But do you see my point here? The people Jesus is praying for in John 17 have largely given us the New Testament. And their message, their message is legitimate. It's reliable. Jesus has revealed, what Jesus has revealed to them is now written for us. And it is reliable. Jesus' prayer gives the apostles authenticity. But let's go back to that prayer where we see Jesus pray for his apostles' protection. Now, have you ever felt like you were somewhere unsafe? That's a dreadful feeling. It's awful. In 2005, there was a deplorable series of incidents called the Cronulla Race Riots. It was a series of horrific acts of violence and vitriolic language between Anglo-Australians and Middle Eastern Australians and some Middle Eastern migrants as well. Now, during the riots, uh, the tension was surrounding who belonged. Who had the right claim to the uh, Cronulla beaches and all these sorts of things? It's a really shameful part of Sydney's history. But what you may not know is that at the time, I was living in Auburn, in Western Sydney, which is actually where many of the Middle Eastern youth who participated in the retaliatory riots came from. They travelled from Western Sydney to, to the beaches. Anyway... Living in Auburn at the time, the atmosphere was awful. It was palpable. The tension was, it was quite thick. But I didn't realise just how unsafe I was as one of only maybe three or four white Australians living in the area. I didn't realise how unsafe I was until one morning I left my house to go to TAFE and etched into the concrete, etched into the concrete out front of my house were the words, an Aussie man is a dead man. I felt dreadfully unsafe. I went back inside, locked the door, locked the windows, closed the blinds, didn't go anywhere for a few days. I felt terrified. I felt like I had no protection, that I was in real danger. But the danger that I was in 
That's nothing compared to the danger that Jesus' apostles are going to be in as they are sent into a hostile world. Also, Jesus is leaving. He's going to the Father, so he's not going to be there to protect them. They're going to need all of the protection that they can get. And so out of love, Jesus prays for their protection. Verse 11, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. And remember that the world refers to humanity in hostile rebellion towards God. This world has been nothing but hostile to Jesus, and it is going to be hostile towards the apostles. Why? Spiritual warfare. What do you feel or think when I mention the words spiritual warfare? I mean, for some of us, the concept of spiritual warfare must feel very real as we try to live our lives for God, try to have faith in Jesus, but we can feel a spiritual attack left, right, and center, trying to drag us away or make us doubt God's goodness. But for some of us, and this is me for the longest time, spiritual warfare felt like it's not even on my radar. You know, I'm not that concerned about it at all. I'm just trying to get through the day. You know, what's, what am I worried about the forces of darkness? That's nothing compared to Bill's. But Jesus... He considers spiritual warfare to be the primary threat facing his apostles in the world to come, in their mission to come. It's not the Roman Empire, nor is it the Jewish leaders who were about to arrest and crucify Jesus after putting him on a mock trial. It's spiritual warfare. And so Jesus prays for their protection because he knows exactly how dangerous this is. He prays that God would protect his apostles by the power of his name, the name which Jesus has, which he has used already to protect his apostles while he was with them. But what's in a name? See, it's more than a name tag. In the ancient world, someone's name was their very identity their personality, their reputation, their character. And so to be protected by God's name is to be protected by his very power, his authority, his love, his strength, his glory and majesty. That's what that's, that's about. It's to be protected by everything that makes God, God. It's like today, if you get sick, you know, you can't go into work, You go to the doctors, you get a doctor's certificate. The doctor's certificate protects you if for whatever reason your employer decides that they're going to unfairly punish you for having a day off, you know, for being sick. The doctor's note protects you. God's name protects his apostles spiritually. And that's what Jesus is praying for, their spiritual protection. But even better... By being protected by God's name, the name that Jesus also has, they are being drawn into that same intimate relationship that Jesus and his Father have. Now, I'm not saying that the apostles become divine like how God is divine. They are still men. But in the Father's name, they are intimately close in perfect relationship, bound by love. The love that God has within himself, but also for them. Bound by God's other person-centered love. And as we've established, the apostles are going to need all of the protection that they can get because Jesus is leaving them to be with the Father. The apostles are left in unfriendly territory where they don't belong. The world. And the world hates them now because their loyalty has changed. They are not loyal to the world, but to the Father, to God, as he has been revealed by Jesus. Verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. 
My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. And here is the chief threat, the chief enemy in this spiritual warfare, the evil one, Satan. Make no mistake, though, Jesus has defeated Satan at the cross. Satan has been defeated, but he still has influence. He can still cause people to doubt how good Jesus is. And you can bet that the apostles, when they were alive, they would have been number one on Satan's hit list because they are Jesus' chief witnesses. But even in this prayer, as it was read out for us before by Reuben, Jesus acknowledges the loss of Judas, who earlier that night, Satan prompted Judas to betray Jesus. But Jesus asks that the Father... Uh, ask the Father that the apostles be protected by his name from Satan, from the evil one, protected by their relationship with the Father, that he, Jesus, is about to win for them at the cross. So how does this part of Jesus' prayer add authenticity to the apostles and their message? Because of the threat, right? Because of the enemy, Satan's primary tactic in this world is to get us to doubt the apostles' message, to get us to doubt Jesus' goodness and power, to get us to doubt what the apostles have written. I mean, Satan spends pretty much all of his energy on this. It's his primary tactic. Why would our enemy do this unless, of course, the apostles' message is true, unless it's the primary threat to him now? But... Even better, if there is any prayer recorded for us in the Bible that the Father has said yes to, it must be this one. It must be this one in John chapter 17, because the Father will say yes to the Son. And this means for us that God has protected the apostles by the power of his name. He has kept them safe from the evil one, and he has maintained the integrity of their message. Jesus' prayer for his apostles gives authenticity to them. But Jesus is leaving, and as he does, he gives his apostles a mission. He gives them a job to do. So let's see Jesus pray for his apostles' mission. Verse 17. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Now, have you ever been in a relay race, maybe at school or at youth group, if you ever went to youth group or some other events, like a corporate team building event or something like that? I mean, you, you must know what a relay race is, right? I mean, someone on your team, the first runner, they run with a baton. Uh, they run to the second person, pass the baton to them, who then pick it up and then run to you, they give you the baton, and then it's your turn to run with the baton. Well, that's kind of what Jesus is praying about here. The Father sent Jesus on a mission into the world to reveal God, to reveal the Father, to reveal that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus has done that. He's shown that to his apostles. And now Jesus is sending his apostles out on the same mission. Reveal who God is, Father, Son, and Spirit, that Jesus is God. The Son has done that, and now the the baton passes to the apostles. It's their turn to run. It's their turn to reveal who God is by their testimony. Jesus has given them a mission. But in the, at the beginning of uh, Jesus giving them this mission, he uses a strange word, sanctify. He says, sanctify them. Basically, that word means make holy. So, okay, we've replaced one strange word with another, sanctify and holy. So what's going on there? Well, holiness means so much. But one of its most basic ideas means being set apart, being uh, set apart for a specific task or goal or purpose or even person. And so Jesus has asked the Father, to sanctify, make holy his apostles by the truth of his word, to immerse his apostles 
in his word, the rock solid truth that Jesus is God, to set them apart for that word, for that message, to devote their lives to the truth, make them holy to it. And certainly, if you read the book of Acts, which takes place after Jesus' death and resurrection and after he goes into heaven, then you can see that that very thing happens. The apostles do devote their lives to the message that Jesus is God. They don't waver from it for decades. So now, as Jesus prepares to leave, he commissions his apostles to go and spread the truth, saying uh, saying that as God the Father sent him, he is sending them. Like father, like son, right? Jesus is leaving, but his mission continues in the apostles, with the apostles. But it's not as if the apostles won't be supported. We've already seen how Jesus prays for their protection. But if you remember uh, last year, when we looked at uh, the earlier parts of John's gospel, you'll remember that Jesus also promises to send them a companion, the, the Holy Spirit. Remember in John chapter 16, verse 13, When Jesus says to his apostles, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And so we see there that all of God, all the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit, are united in this mission to spread the truth that Jesus is God. And now the apostles have been brought into that mission as well. United to God by faith, sharing in that wondrous Mission, the majesty of the mission. Jesus prays for their mission, ensuring its success. And Jesus' prayer gives the apostles authenticity. But then Jesus prays about his own sanctification. And in doing so, he is filling out the content of what the apostles' message will be. Verse 19, For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. And how else will Jesus be sanctified but at the cross? Remember, to be made holy is to be set apart, to be devoted to something or someone or a task. Jesus was sent by his Father to make, he was made holy, devoted to the cross. No one else could do it. No one other than Jesus could possibly go to the cross on our behalf to win our forgiveness, to give his life for us. No one other than Jesus could possibly go to the cross in order to make all who believe in him holy. No one other than Jesus could do this. So Jesus devotes himself to going to the cross in order to ensure that his apostles are made holy. And in doing this, he is also giving them the core of their message, the central focus of their message. They are being sent by Jesus into the world in order to proclaim that Jesus is God, the God who died for them, who died for you, who was not abandoned to death, but rose again from the grave and now sits at God's right hand. Jesus defeated Satan. Defeated death, defeated sin. They are being sent by Jesus in order to proclaim this truth. Brothers and sisters, their proclamation, that truth, that is what we hang our faith on. It means everything to us. It's what we believe. It's what we believe above everything. This is what the apostles have told us about Jesus. This is what is recorded for us in Scripture. And the apostles' testimony is finished, it's complete. That's why Jesus won't choose any more apostles today, because the job is done. It has been proclaimed out of love for the world. Jesus sent his apostles to proclaim the truth, and that truth has been proclaimed ever since. It's even reached us here today on the other side of the planet from where all these events took place. You can bet your life on the apostles' witness. Jesus has prayed for them. And Jesus' prayer gives the apostles authenticity. But is there at all a chance that the apostles made it up? 
Did they get together one day and craft this clever story about a risen Jesus who gives them authenticity? Are they trying to trick everyone into thinking that Jesus is real, just like my friend thought her sister was trying to trick her into thinking narwhals are real? Well, meet Charles Colson. He was special counsel for Richard Nixon during the Watergate scandal, where Nixon's administration tried to cover up a crime, tried to cover up a break-in into a political opponent's office in order to steal information or some such. It was a crime that even President Richard Nixon was possibly a co-conspirator of. And no one, no one would have found out just how far up the ladder went unless just a handful of men kept to a story, unless just a handful of men kept to this story that they had made up. No one would have known how bad this was, but they didn't even last three weeks. They didn't last three weeks. And strangely enough, Colson, who was one of those men, figured out from this event that Jesus is God. It's astounding. Here's why. Here's a quote from Colson himself. I know the resurrection, that the resurrection of Jesus is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would have not endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Brothers and sisters, the apostles' testimony is reliable. You can, you can bet your life on it. It is the truth. Narwhals are real, and Jesus is God. And Jesus' prayer gives the apostles authenticity. Let's pray. Kind Father God, we praise you for your love for us, especially that you have shown us through Jesus. Thank you so much for Jesus, for how he revealed you, for how he chose his apostles, for how he gave them your words, and for how he sent, uh, how he sent them. Father, help us to remember how reliable the apostles' witness is. Help us to have faith in Jesus. Help us to believe, and so also, along with the apostles, be saved. Amen. Amen. Now let's stand and sing about Jesus in what a beautiful name. beginning one with God the Lord most high in hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ what a beautiful name it is what a beautiful name it is the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. He didn't want heaven without. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name.
Please take a seat, friends. Uh, the Word of God is encouraging. Now, in that passage, you obviously heard Adam preach, but did you notice those words sent? Do you notice those words sent where Jesus was sent, the disciples were sent, someone else or maybe a few people in this room, maybe everyone in this room has been sent as well, sent to do the Lord's work. And uh, we also can look at Scripture and be encouraged in other ways. And there's uh, a Scripture that's going to come up on the screen really soon, and I'm going to read that. As you can see there, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. The scriptures are encouraging. And this is an encouraging scripture about giving. What does it say about giving? Well, it says that everyone is involved. Just like the people back in Jesus' day put their gifts into the offering tree, there's people in this room that give. And what does that do? Well, that empowers our mission. And clearly this scripture says it's not about how much. It's about the sacrifice. And... I just wanted to give that scripture to you because I think it's important that we're all involved in this discipleship moment of giving to God's work. And I know we get up from time to time and just say thank you for everybody giving, but that's not really as encouraging as hearing it from actually God's word. I didn't speak those words. God did through Jesus, just like we heard the sermon Jesus praying. And those words are deeply encouraging. So uh, we're thankful for people who give in this church. 
And we love everybody to give what they can to support the work here. So thank you very much. I'm going to invite Rachel up now, and she's actually going to give two little announcements. So two things that are coming up for women in our church. So the first one is the women's breakfast and that's coming up next Saturday. So I know that sometimes you think, oh, Saturday, oh, it's going to be really hard to, to get out of bed and get moving. But I assure you that all the women's breakfasts that I've been to in the past, maybe even if I felt like before, like that before I arrived, when I left, I felt like it was really worth it. So if you're thinking about coming, can you please uh, let me or Bonnie Ann know today? Um, we can help you with your registration, with your paying for your ticket for the breakfast. If you want to bring someone else along with you, you get a discount. So if you bring uh, another friend, uh, you both get a little bit knocked off the price of your breakfast. The caterer is amazing. Apparently, ha- comes highly recommended. Uh, the food's going to be amazing. The fellowship's going to be amazing. Uh, so if you're able to come along le- next Saturday morning from 8 till 10, uh, we'll be here and it should be an amazing time. Now, don't worry if you can't come to that breakfast. There is another opportunity for you to hang out with women from our church. Uh, so it's the Western Sydney Anglican women's conference Uh, and the speaker will be Jenny Salt uh, and it's coming up uh, later on it's going to be the 9th of March um, and it's in the afternoon 2 to 4 30 tickets are $25 Um, you can register um, you can come and ask me for more information you can come and ask Bonnie Ann for more information but that's a time where um, there'll be time for to eat food to connect with other women in the region but also hear a talk for encouragement as well so if you have any questions about those two events please don't hesitate to ask us and we'll help you get registered for them. Uh, Thank you, Rachel. Um, Rachel's too modest to say that she's also speaking at the Women's Breakfast. Uh, The important thing about the Women's Breakfast is that you need to register today. Uh, So please do that. Register for the Women's Breakfast today. Uh, What else is happening in our church? Well, we love to welcome new people to our church. And that's why we run this event called Life Together, where you get to come over to uh, our house. So Rachel, me and the boys. And we share a meal together. But we also get to talk about our church, talk about the vision, the mission and uh, all those things. So uh, we'd love to have those people that are newish to our church to come to that. There's been an email set as well to those newish people that I have a record of. So you should receive that. Uh, The other thing is that uh, we know that when we give announcements, there's lots of information. However, we're slowly rolling out a a new web page for us. uh, Sorry, I should say new website. And... What we're going to release, well, we released one already about life groups, but now we have an events page. So you could have just fallen asleep in those announcements. That's okay. You could go to marsdenpark.church slash events and all of a sudden on the screen you see all the events, you click on the event you like and you get all the information. Wow, technology, right? Uh, so, friends, uh, can I encourage you to use marsandpark.church slash events. Have a look. If you just missed out that whole women's uh, two announcements, well, you can go there, click on that, and you'll be able to see uh, what's going to happen in our church over the next month and as we build on that for the whole entire year. So that, that'll be absolutely fantastic. It was a, whoa, that's all right. Uh, Friends, um, church hasn't finished. Uh, We've got an opportunity to share further in community. And though that big roller door will open up and we can go out there and share morning tea together, uh, have a coffee or a tea and we'll have a great time. Uh, Please also collect your children uh, from the kids' church because it's a little bit difficult now. They've moved a bit further away, actually into much better classrooms they're wonderful and beautiful but it just requires you if you've got children to go over there uh, as soon as you can that would be absolutely fantastic Uh, the other thing is uh, we obviously love connecting with people and there's opportunities for you to connect in various ways and there's an opportunity to give you uh, give your information to us and that, that connection could be that I really enjoyed the prayer in the service today and uh, yep, and we will be able to uh, yeah pray for you or something like that. So please use the Connect cards. Uh, one last thing that I have to grab something because it's a special moment. Is we've had a special man come to our church uh, over the past 
It's almost a year now, Reverend James, isn't it? Um, can you come up on stage? Because I'd like to uh, th- thank you uh, for coming along. So Re- Reverend James uh, is Samuel's dad. Where's Samuel? There he is. Uh, and Reverend James has been here for almost a year now. And, and Reverend uh, James comes from Gulu City in the northern Uganda diocese. And he's been obviously a, a blessing to his family family, but he's also been a blessing to our church family. And, and we're just really thankful that you, you came to us and we've really enjoyed having you. And here's a, here's a certificate. So uh, you, you've got <laughs> so, something to uh, remember us by. He's also got a, a ton of books there. But um, Re- Reverend James has done a fantastic ministry. I mean, you know, we just started Alpha last year. Uh, actually, I might get you to say just a couple of words on Alpha. Uh, he's taken hold of that course and he's now, wait, is it 120? 121 people that he's doing that course to in Australia to people in Uganda. Uh, how fantastic is that? That, that is, a, that is a, a fantastic ministry and that is not, you know, to, just because we did something small in the neighbourhood centre, we had a few people come along, which was a blessing, but Reverend James has taken that and he has blessed so many people. It's almost like that idea of the parable of the mustard seed, right? Like just from small things, big things grow. And why do they grow? Well, they grow because actually God is 100% in control. So, you know, when you hear the Alpha announcement, we'll run Alpha again. Don't think there and go, I can't be bothered. Think about how wonderful that has been to the people that Reverend James is ministering to in Uganda. It's so, so powerful. So, so powerful. People will come to trust in Jesus through this ministry of Alpha. And I know you do wonderful ministry and they're going to obviously, you'll be a blessing when you return, but you've been a blessing to us. Could I pray for you now, Reverend James? Uh, Father God, we just want to really thank you for uh, Reverend James and we thank you for his wonderful ministry. Uh, We're just so happy for him uh, coming to Australia and obviously such a, a blessing to Samuel and Winnie and the family. And Lord, such a blessing to us. And Lord, we could we should just rejoice uh, in in this alpha thing that you have enabled to happen, uh, Reverend James. Uh, through you, your guidance of the Holy Spirit, has started this up for many people in his area of Uganda. And God willing, we will see people come to trust in Jesus because of this and we should be just so thankful as a church thankful for reverend james and just want to see this ministry grow and grow and grow and in jesus name we pray amen uh praise jesus i would like to give simple uh word of praise to you people by saying thank you, thank you, thank you, I thank you a lot because of meeting together in the name of Jesus. I would have not been even able to come this way, but with the God blessed and God allowed me to come. I would like even to pray for you people of the Live Church Anglican because of hosting me here for a number of times, I was with you. So my last day in Australia is today. Tomorrow I will be flying off to Dubai, then from Dubai to Entebbe, my homeland in Uganda, Africa. So I will tell them about you people, how really love my family and me by staying with you. So I'm still leaving my family here. And I wish you to keep cooperating with them because I will still come back for the holy matrimony, which is going to take place hopefully next year. I believe it to be so. For Samuel and his wife. So Winnie. So I think that one will take place here, not everywhere else. So let us be together in Christ. Uh, as it is written in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 
verse 1 and 2. As co-workers of God, uh, God says, He has helped us during His favor time. And He saved us during our time of suffering. So please, let us not leave the word of God. And the reason why the world is still standing, standing still because of we believers. And if believers are not here in Australia, you look at you, it looks very few, but if you are not there, the world will change automatically today, not tomorrow. So due to that, because Jesus still sees us living creatures abiding by the Bible words on earth, he is still taking care of us. May the living God bless you all in Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. And we also printed out a number of Alpha booklets so you can take back to your uh, friends that uh, can't do it online and would prefer the booklet, so we've got a number of them. Thank you. God bless, brother. Thank you very much. Uh, friends, uh, thank you, and please uh, share some hospitality with um, yeah, Reverend James as we go to our morning tea now. God bless.